against Virginia Tech. And the first pitch of the ball game is a strike from Hartle to freshman Zion Rose, and we are underway. This is a critical series for both these teams. Neither has won an ACC series yet. Hartle's pitch swinging a foul. Third base side, and that's nothing in two. Rose out of IMG Academy, a Chicago native. Speedy designated hitter. That's one of the things that stands out, Gabby, is that this Louisville team will run all over the place. They, they always do, and that's one of the things that Coach Dan McDonald wants to see his team. He wants to put pressure on that pitching staff to make sure that they're thinking about the runners at first base. One of the things that we have looked at and talked about is Josh Hartle, and he's getting guys into two strikes. He is just not getting them away with his pitches, which he was able to do last year. One, two in the dirt. It's two and two to Rose. So we mentioned how critical this series is for Louisville. It's been seven straight ACC series losses going back to last year. They missed the NCAA tournament. Rose files that one away. And that's been unusual in the Dan McDonald area. Louisville's been one of the top programs in the country. But they have a lot of youth that is coming, although we're not seeing a ton of it in the lineup tonight. And they are very, very dynamic. Yeah, I mean, really the only freshman that they have in the lineup right now is Zion Rose, who is having a heck of a B against Josh Hartle, making him throw pitches. The seventh pitch of the at-bat misses outside, and the count's full to the leadoff man for Louisville in the first. Rose with J.T. Benson, the senior on deck. Hartle waiting for the sign he wants and the payoff. Ball four outside, and it's a leadoff walk. Wow, what an at-bat there by a freshman, Zion Rose. Started off the count at 0-2. Worked its way back all the way, gets eight pitches, gets himself to walk. We look at the pitch percentages and the pitch arsenal. He's got the cutter at 31%, the fastball at 29, slider curveball and changeup. But when you look at it, he can throw every single pitch and every single count. He's been doing a really good job this year of getting ahead and getting counts to 0-2. It's the put-away pitch. Once you, he gets into 0-2, it's almost like he's trying to be perfect. And you don't have to be perfect when you get to 0-2. The batter is the one that's worried, not the pitcher. So he has to be able to attack even on the top part of that zone. Here comes the 0-1 to Benson instead of throw to first. And that's going to be something to keep an eye on, too. Hartle usually pretty good at controlling the running game. As you mentioned, Louisville 50 of 60 in stolen base attempts as a team to open the year. Rose has two of them. Hartle set. And here comes the 0-1. Instead, another throw to first, and Rose is back. You know, we talked a little bit to Tom Walter this week, the head coach at Wake, Gabby, about how they can try and control Louisville's game. He really felt confident that Hartle would be able to do that by himself. Pitch. It's nothing to do. And here we go, another 0-2 count. These are the ABs. Right now, you put the pressure on the hitter. You can throw your best pitch, still trying to throw a strike. Maybe something on the inside part of the corner. See if you can jam them up and get yourself a double play. A long hold from Hartle in the 0-2. Swing a grounder, that might be it. To short, second for one, on to first. He's trying to get Benson. He's on the save. He wants to go look at it. Well, you called for it. Gabby, and he ended up getting it rolled up. And, and that's what you want to see out of a pitcher like Josh Harvey. Not try to be perfect, not always trying to get the strikeout. You have a guy on first base, the hitter is behind in the count. Go out there, throw your pitch, get something that you know you can get a ground ball, double play, get yourself back to nobody on base. To me, that looks like he's out. I think the Green Street are home plate umpire. And you call him out. So call is confirmed a double play and a big double play for Hartle. Two outs, nobody on in this top of the first. And that'll bring up Luke Napleton. Transfer from Division II Quincy. We led all Division II players in home runs a year ago. Takes a breaking ball low, 1-0. He has put up a big power display, including three homers on Friday night against Virginia Tech. Here comes the 1-0. So tap it back to the mound. Gloved by Hartle, he'll underhand to first. Inning over. First pitch from Gagora, 
is outside a ball and the bottom of the first underway. Williams off to an excellent start to his college career. 400 batting average and on base more than 50% of the time. He's ahead 2-0. Oh. Out of the Tabor Academy. He's become one of the table setters for this Wake Forest team as he takes a strike. It's 2-1. Wake's Perfect offense hasn't board. been the issue, Gabby. They have been a pretty good offensive team. They just have not pitched well in conference play. You know, not only the pitching, they've made mistakes on the field that have cost them some games, and I'm talking about Wake. We go to Louisville, they've been hitting the heck out of the baseball. It's that pitching, like you said, that has been kind of keeping them back. But if they can figure out that pitching, this is a very, very dangerous ball club. They can pick it. They could hit it. They are fouled away. Wake last year won every weekend series in the ACC. They were 10 for 10. I think they had a string of 11 straight ACC series win going back to the end of the 22 season. As you get a look at Tom Walter, their head coach. And Williams drives that one fouled on the left field line. This season, they've lost both series at home to Duke, opening weekend of ACC play. And then last week, dropping two out of three to Virginia. Here's the pass. Outside ball four, and Williams draws a leadoff walk. Well, Mike, I, I will say this, though. Both teams that beat them are very good ball clubs. Both teams are ranked. Both have very good teams. Uh, it's, it's a fun ACC this year because there's a lot of ranked teams, a lot of good teams, and even teams that aren't ranked are playing really good baseball who can beat you at any point at any time. Here's Adam Tellier, who's been the best offensive player for Wake so far, the grad transfer from Ball State. First pitch. He swings and rips one foul on the left field line out of play. Boy, that one was a tattoo. Tellier can do it all. He's waiting for that pitch. Yeah. <laughs> Tellier said, hey, I've got nine homers this season. I'm going to try to make it 10. I know you're going to try to come get me, especially trying to get ahead early. Tell you're getting the start of third base today. And he scores the bunt, puts it in the air. Gangora has it. He will fake throwing behind the runner at first. And that's the first down. Yeah, how about that? You ambush first pitch, and then the second one, you're trying to drop down that bunt, see if you can get yourself on. He just got underneath that baseball. When you're butting, you don't want to turn that bat head up. You want to stay on top. Yeah, that's just one unfortunate for uh, Tellier there because I guarantee you that he's back in this dugout going, mm, one, I missed that first pitch, and two, I needed to get that ball down. Here's Seaver King the, hitting in the three-hole, making the start at shortstop today. We mentioned the injuries to Wake Forest. Two key members of their lineup are out. Preseason All-American Nick Kurtz, who was an All-American last season at first base, is down with a shoulder issue, although they expect him back next weekend against North Carolina. First pitch to King misses. Merrick Houston, their sure-handed shortstop, who is putting together a really solid sophomore year, has been out of the lineup a couple of times. He had a hamstring issue last week that cost him a game. And this week, in, before their midweek game Tuesday against High Point, he was hit in the head during batting practice. And he's in their concussion protocol. There is hope that Houston, who was feeling better as the week went on, could be back next weekend as well. But those are two big players that Wake Forest is without tonight. And you got to give it up for Tom Walters, too, to not try to rush a guy back and say, hey, you got smoked in the head. You're in concussion protocol. Safety first. We're going to make sure that you're 100% ready to go before we put you back onto that field. One and two, the count to King. He is an aggressive hitter with power. A great start to his career at Wake Forest. He is a transfer from Wingate, a Division II school. We've seen more D2 transfers, D3 transfers come into Division I ball through the transfer portal, and he is one of the potential stars. Long hold in the 1 2. Down low, the count 2 and 2 to King. I know he's working a count here, Gabby, but boy, he wants to swing the bat. He is aggressive, he plays with swag. Well, he's got that yes, 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 no mentality. Me and that pitch is coming, and I'm hitting it until my body tells me, my eyes say no. And you can see every single time, every single pitch, 
He's getting out there. That foot's getting down. Those hands are almost coming forward, and then his hand, his eyes are telling him no, and he's stopping himself. That's how you become that good hitter. Way outside, and the count's full to King. Scoreless here in the bottom of the first, but Wake has a man on. And now a 3-2 pitch coming to Seaver King. It's got half a dozen home runs. There's power here. Let's see if they go ahead and send Williams as well. Guy that can make contact, put a guy in, in running, see if they can get guys on. Takes ball four low, and so two walks in the first inning, and Wake threatening. And here comes Jack Winnay. Winnay has been hitting sixth in this lineup. He started the year in the outfield playing at first base with Nick Kurtz out, as he did in their final game in Omaha a year ago. Winnay, the sophomore from Massachusetts, has had a very good start to the season. And I'll be honest, I'm a little surprised they moved him into the cleanup spot based on our conversation with Tom Walter the other day. Yeah, he said, he said, you know what? He's hitting good in the sixth position. I don't like to move guys too much when they're hitting good. But here's the problem. When you have a guy like Nick Kurtz who's out, you're going to need to move some guys up, and guys are going to have to step up. And Renee is one of those guys who's been swinging the bat extremely well in a position right now with first and second, a guy in scoring position to put Wake ahead. That he says, hey, I've got to be able to move him. He rips that one through the left side. It's a base hit. Williams to third. He'll hold on there. And Wake has the base and load with one out. The ball gets away. Williams is going to try and score, and he will, and the other runners move up. one nothing Wake for us. That's just head-up base running by everybody on that field. It's getting to the right spot, taking that hard turn to get that throw in. As soon as that ball gets picked off, and we're going back to the hit, which is a beautiful swing by Wene, staying through that baseball and driving it, you're going to see that good turn around third, which causes that throw to come in mishandled. But not only do you get Williams to come in and score, you have King, who was at second. He moves over to third. And then Wene, he gets himself into scoring position, getting himself into second. So keeping your eyes on the ball, making sure you're seeing everything. Great base running there by everybody on Lake Forest. Here's Jake Reinish that uh, scored a single and an E7 that allows the runner to score and the others to move up. Reinish is senior key part of Wake Forest lineup two years ago. Battled injuries and was out of the lineup for a lot of last year. He was off to a good start as you can see with five homers. A chance to really bust things open for Wake in the first. A check swing roller to the left side. Diving stopped by Beard. A run is going to score and everybody will be saved. It's an infield single. Beard may have saved a run. Yeah, Beard did a beautiful job of just knocking that ball down. A run came in, but that would have been easy for two to come in. So it's a heck of a play, a half of a swing for Reinish, but a great job of just basically knocking that ball down, keeping it, holding it in, in the infield, keeping the double play in order. You have one out right now, first and third, so a great job there by Beard to be able to knock it down. Roger Williams, pitching coach for Louisville, going to come out to the mound to visit with the Angora as his pitch count's already risen 20 here. You know, look at Beard. Beard, a very good defender. This is a solid defensive team for Louisville. Maybe not the best defensive team, Dan. Hey, it happens in baseball. But if you look at this team and the way they've been playing all year, really, really good defensively and really good hitting. Tate by Estero at the plate. Grad transfer from St. John, switch hitting catcher. He's DH some, getting the start behind the plate tonight. He and Cameron Gill splitting time. As Gangora set in the first pitch. Estero serves it foul. First base side, not a play. And we talk about two with Gangora where you don't want to walk weight because they can turn walks into runs very quickly. They're, they have two runs on the board right now. Both of those came on via because of the walk. This is a very good hitter's ballpark. That one upstairs, it's one and one. There's a little bit of a breeze blowing out towards left center, but David F. Count's ballpark, one of the best home run hitter parks in the nation. Wake usually among the offensive leaders. You get a look at this beautiful facility in Winston-Salem. That's a strike. Count one and two. Yeah, from Gongora, even with the curveball there, He's got to get that ball down. 
You see how everything is kind of up in the zone, especially with the secondary pitches. That's a very quick way to get hit for Homer. Pitch in the air. Right center field. Coming in is the right fielder making the catch is Kim. Runner tag is coming home. The throw out on time. And it's now 3 0 weight. Astero with a sacrifice fly gets another run home for Wake Forest in the first. And again, for Wake Forest, it's just understanding the game plan. You got first and third, try to get that ball up in the air. You're looking for something that is elevated, something that you can drive to center field, right center field to be able to just get the job done. And Ballastero just did that right there perfectly. Didn't try to do too much with that pitch, just understood. I have first and third. I want to get the ball up in the air. I want to drive it to the outfield, get the sack fly, get an extra run. Austin Hawk bats the transfer from UNC, second baseman. First pitch. He swings and fouls it away. 0 and 1. Slow start to his Wake Forest career here, but Austin Hawk, the younger brother of former Wake center fielder Tommy Hawk. 5'9, 170 pounds. If he is half as aggressive as his older brother, he will be one of the biggest pests in the ACC. I mean that as a compliment. Outside, it's what a one. Well, you ask anybody in that Wake Forest, the fans, even the guys who played with them, everybody loved themselves some Tommy Hawk. And we saw it last year when we went to the uh, to the Super Regionals. Boy, that the whole fan base was loving him. So over to first. The runner dives back. Yeah, Tommy Hawk started that Super Regional bottom of the first with a solo home run, helping to lead Wake to Omaha for the first time in 68 years. There's a strike. And it's one and two. We were in the ballpark for those games in Winston-Salem. The atmosphere was electric. This is a fan base that was looking for something to cheer about. Boy, they had a great season, and they were the number one team in the nation coming into this year with five preseason All-Americans. Another throw over to first. Reddish is back. 3 nothing Wake, last of the first. Uh, next pitch will be the 28th of the inning for Gondora. That's ripped foul. Range one and two. Listen, Gondora's got some good stuff on the mound, and he knows it, and so does everybody else. The problem is, is when you're playing against a team like Wake Forest, you know how good they are. You try to end up being perfect, and when you try to be perfect, you usually leave the pitches right down the middle. Wake's hitters fouling off a number of pitches in this inning. And again, already the 30th. Now, Gondora's gone into the sixth inning in all of his outings so far this year. Seems to be a little bit more efficient to get there today. First pitch fouled away again by Hawk. Another good long at bat from a Wake Forest hitter. Right now you can see every single pitch of Angora. It's just basically missing middle, middle away for a hitter. You have two strikes. Got to bury some stuff. You got to just get guys' feet moving so they're not comfortable just saying, hey, He's not coming in. Everything's staying away. I can crowd the plate on him. Watch outside. Change up that time. It's two and two. Well, you're right. I, I was just having this conversation with somebody the other day, talking about lefties who command that ball inside to right-handed hitters. It oh. seems like they're the ones that have the most success. Two-two. In the dirt, and the count is full. It gets away, and Ryan should take off for second. Another 390 feet. Yeah, if you're a lefty and you're able to control that inside part of the plate, I don't care how hard you throw, it's going to be tough. When we take a look at the jump, I mean, just beautiful. Reads the ball in the dirt, understands that ball gets away. I need to make get myself into second base, put myself into scoring position. Ninth pitch of the at bat, and Hawk drives it up the alley, right center field, on the run, and making the two-handed catch. Crash. Always that like one kind of stretch where they either do really well or really, you know, falter, and that's kind of what hurt them. I believe that last year they should have been in the tournament. I felt like they were one of those teams that kind of just got taken out because I guess there was a lot of ACC teams that were in, 
but I, I do feel like they should have made it. I felt like they had the record to be able to get in. Since 2007, only LSU and Vanderbilt have won more games than Louisville. And, you know, really, I think it was probably that last series of the season that, that kind of put the final nail in their year. They went to Florida State and dropped two out of three to a Knowles team that was really struggling last season. And, and that was probably about it. It's been hit in the air in center field, moving over and making the catch. It's Ken Nelson, the freshman outfielder. Now back to the Cardinals. Old man gone here. Louisville second. Three nothing. Wake. Here's Michael Lippy. But this has been one of the best programs in the country the last 20 years. And Dan McDonald is, I think, one of the best coaches in America. He is one of my favorites to talk to. I always said that if I had a kid, I would want them to play for Coach McDonald because. I think he's tough on guys, but tough on them in the right way. And you talk to big leaguers who've had him as coaches over the years, he has had a big impact on their lives. Well, it's not only that, is that when you talk to him, it's all about playing the game the right way. Going out there, hustling, making sure that you're giving 100%. And if you're not, he's going to tell you something about it. Chopper foul, it's one and two. You know, when we got to speak with him, he was telling us, you know, there's a difference where guys are coming from high school high school guys and i get it i understand you're watching those big league games you're watching the big league guys go out there it's not the same from high school to college college you better go out there you better give a hard 90 you better rush so it's fun to see those guys develop from freshman year to all of a sudden being that junior going whoa what a huge you know change that that player made and you, if you have the right coach like Dan McDonald, he's going to help you out. He's going to help you understand, hey, this is how you get to that next level. So we do the count. It's for sophomore Whitney from Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin. He's down on strikes. And the first strikeout for Josh Hartle, two outs. Coming for the Cardinals, the refielder, number 42. I'll tell you this for Hartle, I guarantee you, this is kind of like, okay, here we go. Those are the pitches that we talk about. He's got that good cutter. When he throws it down in the zone, it's going to break almost like that slider. It's just going to be a little bit harder. And when he has that pitch going, he gets tough to hit because you've got to worry about 93, 94 on that fastball. He's got four pitches that he's able to throw for strikes, and he can throw them on any count. So you get a chopper foul by Eddie King Jr. It's nothing in two. King out of Chicago. Place that Louisville has recruited very successfully. To Marion Catholic, they do a great job in the north. Drops it short. King has it over the top to first and a one-two-three second for Josh Hartle. Three nothing way because we head to the bottom of the second. On this. It's really even keel. No highs, no lows. Doesn't matter how the team's doing. He is just there to help. First pitch butt attempt by Cam Nelson and the freshman yeah, that's over one out. Yeah, those are the situations where if I'm Wake Forest, I don't want to get one out with one pitch. Just because of what you were able to do in that first inning, you were able to get him to throw 33 pitches. You always look at a series as a whole, not just in one game. And if you're able to get that starting pitcher out of there early, that means that you used up a whole bunch of that bullpen. And using up a whole bunch of that bullpen is going to help you in game two and three. Mitchell Salvino with his first start of the year. I mean, you saw Tom Walter giving some encouragement to the freshman Cam Nelson there. You, you understand the idea, right? You have a lefty, falls off a little bit to the third base side. If you can drag it past him, Nelson has speed, and you can put pressure on right away. But that's two butt attempts that have resulted in an out for Wake so far, up and away. One and two. I, I, you know, I'll be honest. I don't think of Wake as a bunting team with Tom <laughs> Walter and Bill uh, Salento as their hitting coach. They have been a slugging team more than that. Now they are athletic, but um, it's a little surprising to see them dropping bunts down. It feels like. Into the dirt. No, it hit him. And so a two-strike hit batter, and so Wake does end up with Trent. And of course, with one out, leading to the top of the order. Well, just a curveball that he just pulled a little bit. Ends up catching the back foot of Salvino is what it looked like to me. You see the two-strike approach, too. Yeah, just gets that back knee as he was trying to drive it down into the dirt as he was going to swing. You know, he's looking to swing at that pitch. He was able to hold off and bar hit, so that's unfortunate there. 
for Gungora. And out of the top of the order with Javar Williams. Williams walked to lead off the game. Bridge to the freshman left-handed hitter is down low ball, 1-0. And same thing that we talked about with Bartle, too, right, in the first inning. Fine, guy gets on, go right after that next hitter. Use your best pitch to get your ground ball, whatever that might be, whether it's the slider or that fastball in. Pitch there, it's one and one. And it just seems Gingora has not been ahead of a whole lot of hitters to this point. There's the set. You're right, and I think that Wake Forest sees that too, and they're not trying to be extra aggressive. Usually if a guy is pumping strikes, you're going to get guys to swing and miss a lot more. They're going to be seeing it, hey, we got to go up there swinging, and that's when you expand the zone. When you're not throwing strikes, you can go ahead and relax a little bit more and keyhole the pitcher. There's a strike, it's two and two. So there are ten hitters, he's thrown six first pitch strikes. But three three ball counts to this point for Gangora. Lefty relies on his command a bit. The 2 2. And serve into shallow center field. It's a base hit for Williams. Stopping at second is Salvino. And Wake Forest threatening again up 3 0 in the second. Well, that was, that's a good pitch by Gangora. Nothing really he can do there. It's just a really good job of hitting by Williams. Uh, that pitch is in, jams him, but he's able to stay through that baseball and use his power to get it over the infield and get himself a hit. For Gongoro, though, still, double play is in order. But now you're starting to get into the heavy, heavy hitters, and here's Adam Tellier. He tried to bunt and popped one up his first time. Nine home runs on the year for the third baseman. He swings and fouls it away. He doesn't get cheated, does he? No. And how about this, Mike? Remember, his first A.B., he was looking for that heater and hit it foul. I mean, hit it a mile. I was gonna, I was just going to say, I wonder if Gungora is going to come right after him again with that fastball or say, you know what, I think you're going to be aggressive on me. Let me throw my secondary pitches. But he didn't. He went right after him. A hold and the 0-1. The outside, it's one of them. This is what Tillinger has done in his last six games. Four homers, two doubles in that stretch. He has really carried the Wake offense with Nick Kurtz out. And Kurtz struggling from a batting average and power standpoint to open the year. The All-American first baseman. The one one. Smart foul off his foot. That smarts. One and two. And for Tillier, too, when you look at it, he has reached base safely in all 20 games. So he's consistently on base. He's there. He leads the Deeks with 17 extra base hits. First in doubles. He's tied in home runs. He has been doing it all. And again, we, we got to go back to Nick Kurtz not being in the lineup. You have to look for guys to take that big step because you lose a lot of power and average in a guy like Kurtz. The one, two. Good tank on a breaking ball low. It's two and two. These weak hitters are not chasing an awful lot against Gongora, and it's helping them build up this pitch count as he's approaching 50 here in the second inning. And this becomes a big pitch in this at bat. Two and two. Instead of pickoff play to second, Salvino back standing. Outfield playing straight up for Tellier. So is the infield. They're at double play depth. Hoping that Gangora can get one rolled over and get out of this inning. Here's the set. And the 2 2. Check swing. Did he go around? He did. Tell you wanted them to appeal. They didn't. You know, it's hard for you as a home plate umpire to be able to call a pitch and look at it. But they are taught, hey, do you see that he went around? Go ahead and say he's out. First pitch is an off speed one in the dirt to Seaver King, 1 0. Oh. King walked back in the first. Wake put up a three spot, and King certainly has the power to change the scoreboard here. Angora set, and the 1 0. Oh. Breaking ball inside, it's 2 and nothing to Seaver King. 
what it's going to be interesting to see right now what you're going to do here first and second two and zero. Oh. you definitely don't want to load the bases because you have one a coming up who's also can smoke the baseball liner in the center field on the move making a diving attempt is the center fielder lippy it's passed him into the wall two runs are going to come home to score king streaking the third in their feet first with a two-run triple it's five nothing wait for it well, what a swing by king two and no oh, doesn't try to pull it tries to use the big part of the field and i'll tell you this i thought lippy was going to come up with this ball he had a great jump he sees it tries to dive to make it just out of his reach but a beautiful attempt to try to save some runs you can see it just hits right off the tip top of his glove how about Seaver king the way he got around them paces getting himself to third knocking in two he is an incredible athlete second triple of the year ninth of his career going back to division two with, at wingate Seaver King with a big three base hit. Now the count two at all on the cleanup man, Jack Wade. Wade singled to load the bases and then a throwing error on the left fielder, JT Benson, allowed a run to score back in the first. The pitch. Down low, the count three and nothing. I'll tell you this if I'm Tom Walters, go ahead. You have the green light. He throws you a fastball down the middle, you can go ahead and attack. Gore to the belt, the 3 0. There's a strike, it's 3 and 1. Apparently, he didn't want to attack. <laughs> you know, hey, there's guys. I, I wasn't a guy that loved swinging 3 0. I would every once in a while if I knew the pitcher and I saw his pitches really well. That one fouled away by Lene, and the count is full. But on most cases, you know, what? go ahead, throw me a strike 3 0, because that's when you're going to have to throw me again on 3 and 1. And I'm going to be ready to hit it. I'm going to time you as good as I can possibly time you. So when you throw it the next pitch, I'll be able to go ahead and attack it. Three and two, the count to 1A, the pitch. Breaking ball down low, ball four. They appeal to first, no swing. And the inning continues. So another long inning here for Wake Forest hitters. And here comes Jake Reinish, an infield RBI single, his first trip. This looks like the relentless Wake Forest offense that we saw so many times last year. All the names are different, Gabby, but this feels an awful lot like peak Wake. The, the, the names might be different, but the philosophy never changes. And these guys are going up there with understanding what they have to do to be able to be successful. And that's something that Tom Walters does really well with this ball club. And it bounces a foul, another one. And they get a lot of credit for the work that they've done with their pitching, with the Wake Forest pitching lab. You get a look at Coach Walter, Corey Muscara, and his staff do a great job there. But they have been really an excellent offensive team in the Tom Walter era. The 0-1. So a foul out of play, and the count nothing in two. You think about some of the names that have come through. You know, we talked about Brock Wilkin earlier, the first rounder a year ago, the ACC's all-time home run leader, but guys like... Gavin Sheets and Stuart Fairchild, guys who were in the big leagues, who were big parts of a super regional team at Wake Forest as well. The 0-2. Good take there by Reinish on a breaking ball in the dirt. It's 1-2. Already 60 pitches for Gongora. And Gabby, they just do not seem to be biting on anything off speed out of the zone. They're seeing it, and I'm pretty sure that the game plan is we're going to look up in the zone. Anything that's down, we're going to let it go. And I think that's the only way that Gungoro was getting those swings and misses. So that's why that curveball, when he throws it for a strike, it's up, but they're not even swinging at it. Everybody's just kind of waiting for that fastball and attacking that one pitch. One, two. Off the plate. Count even. It's two and two. It's just tough. I mean, they have a good game plan right now. And Gungoro, even when he gets you into two strikes, it's almost like nibbling every single time, trying to be perfect because of you looking at what's going on. Oh, if I leave it down the middle, they're hitting me. 2-2, two, two, called strike three. 
That time he landed the breaking ball, and the inning is with him. You know, he was getting around the baseball a little bit too much and getting it back on point like he was last year where you saw that whiff rate was way up. We have seen those changes starting today because he is getting out there. Those pitches have a lot more dive down into the zone. Yeah, one and one. Bottom third of the order here for Louisville, starting with Ryan McCoy, Logan Beard, and Dylan Roy. But Hartle was a guy who is not overpowering with his stuff. And and I think that's the part that's so interesting about him is he really is. It, it's not fair to call him a finesse pitcher. He has had excellent command. And, uh, our good friend Darren Vaught from the ACC Baseball Etc. Po podcast pointed out that one of the issues with Hartle has been that he has just had more pitches in the middle of the plate this season than he did a year ago. It doesn't seem like the stuff is backed up at all. It's just execution right now. And here's the thing. It's not like he's not getting into two strike counts. He has been. It's just not being able to put the guy away. We saw it in the first at bat with Rose where he got him 0-2 right off the bat and then all of a sudden ends up walking him because he could not get him out with that after 0-2. There's a lot of different things that happen in that situation. Trying to get the chase on the breaking ball. McCoy held up and the count is full. You know, you talk about your, your breaking ball, you talk about the cutter, the fastball. When you get to 0-2 sometimes as a pitcher, we talked about it with Congoro too, trying to be too perfect. All four inside as that breaking ball backed up and the lead off five nothing wake in the third. First pitch, chopped to the left side. Love there by Tellier to second for one, no relay to first. A good hard slide to stop Hawk from turning the double play. Yeah, Hawks looking back going, hey, now, come on, yeah, man. Really he hit me on <laughs> top of second base. Yeah, as a hitter, as a base runner, you know, you want to be able to get yourself to second base. And at least if you're going into second, it's hard when you're sliding on a turf field to just stop. On a dirt field, you're going to have that, you know, a little bit more brace where you're going to stop yourself slowly. On turf, you just keep sliding. There's Dylan Hoy, first pitch in the dirt. Oh, no, Hoy had a transfer from Marist. And several transfers on the field today for Louisville. Three, as a matter of fact, from four-year schools. Okay, good start offensively. Solid defender as well. Away from first is Beard. Pitch in the dirt. That's 2-0. Oh. This is the one rare times that we've seen Harlow fall behind 2-0 oh, with Ballestero. Ballestero is a really good receiver at the bottom of the strike zone. And while he may not throw credit as well as Cameron Gill, that's one of the major reasons why he's catching Josh, Josh Hartle is to get that low strike for him on those borderline pitches. In the dirt, it's three in. Well, it's interesting listening to Coach Walter break that down because Gill has an excellent defensive reputation. Todd Enter Donato, his former coach at Wofford, is now at, at, at Boston College. Called Gill one of the best defenders that he's had at the position. And, Ballestero is just really good getting that low pitch. That one's too low. And it's a pair of walks here in the inning for Hartle. Yeah, just he lost his command there. Was, I mean, even on a 3-0 pitch, you think, hey, he's not going to be swinging. It's a 5 nothing ball game. Just to the top of the middle, the middle and just kind of the pitch. Uh, here we go with Rose coming up to bat, who had an excellent first A-B. And all of a sudden, with one swing of the bat, Louisville could be right back into this. Two homers for the freshman, the designated hitter. The first pitch to Zion Rose is hit on the ground to the left side and threw for a base hit. It's going to get Louisville on the board as Williams bobbles it, a runner heading to third now. He's safe, and Rose heads up, base running behind the play, gets to second. It's 5-1 Wake. Boy, we talked about the good base running by Wake Forest. Well, we just finished seeing it there. I mean, great job by Rose. He was going to be aggressive. You know that Hartle doesn't want to fall behind after giving up four straight balls. 
gets a pitch, drives it into left field. It is misplayed by Williams in left, and because of that, it's an easy score. But then you have those base runners who, looking at the play, never stops running and get their things. <laughs> Donald told us it's getting these guys to understand to play hard every single game. First pitch misses inside to JT Benson. This is a key moment in this game for Wake Forest. They have seen the big inning spiral out of control with some defensive misplays in Hartle's first two starts. It's a grounder to the left side this time. Tell you're coming home, and they've got a man hung up. They will tag him. No, he's safe. He got around the tag of Tellier, and the bases are loaded. Excellent base running from Hoy. Wow. I mean, what happened there was that Tellier kept moving towards home plate. And because he kept moving towards home plate, you are narrowing that area of that base runner. But if you don't get that ball quickly, he's going to be right around you. So you can see it's going to be aggressive. I'm going to come home. And right here, you can see he just gets around him. By the time he gets that baseball, that tag is going to be right on you. you. This ball needs to get released earlier. There it is. It's a missed tag. What they're going to try to say is that he was out of the baseline. You do have from the line that you set up, you know, you have three feet. So now they're going to go back and look, and it looks like they're going to keep it there. And you have bases loaded. They had good heads up base running. You are supposed to take off with one out to home. You want to stay out of that double play. Well, that is some excellent base running from Hoy and a judgment call that can't be reviewed. It was key, it was very clear that Tellier did not get the tag on Hoy as he went back. It was just a matter of, to your point, Andrew, whether or not he went outside that three foot area that you're allowed after the runner creates their own baseline. And now there's power at the plate of Napleton. You mentioned earlier he led all of Division II in homers last year. Takes a strike, it's one and one. Bases loaded for Louisville, a chance to come back in this game with one swing. Third pitch, breaking ball hit in the air, center field, going back onto the warning track, looking up, it's gone! Look, Napleton with a grand slam, and Louisville's tied the game at five. Oh my goodness, Luke Napleton, we said the power was there. Led all of Division II last year with 29 home runs, led in RBIs as well with 87. Coming up big with the seventh home run of the season, driving it out to the big part of the ballpark, center field. Boy, he did not miss this baseball. It's a breaking ball, catches the middle part of the plate, doesn't try to pull this baseball. Hits it where you're supposed to, and boy, just shows off the power. And how about that? Louisville comes all the way back to tie this ball game in the third. Kate Ballestero was having a conversation with our home plate umpire, Gregory Street, for a while. It was animated. So the Louisville coaches ended up getting involved. We're not entirely sure what that is about, but his first pitch is in the dirt here to Gavin Key. It's 1-0. and oh. Obviously some frustration, has to be some frustration on Wake Forest part at this point for Louisville. Absolute elation as that one bounced foul. Hey Mike, we talked about it. They can swing the baseball bat. The numbers are there. It is proven. They are never out of a ball game because you can hit the baseball. You can get guys moving. The pitch lined into left center field, moving over as Williams will make the catch. And Keelan is down for out number two. Yeah, the court. The Lip, five five to score, top of the third, a five run inning for Louisville. While wow, looking at Josh Hortle, too, he was just cruising those first two innings. He was looking unhittable. And then all of a sudden, you get to a position where you walk the leadoff hitter in McCoy, and then all of a sudden, things start to happen. A fielder's choice, a walk. You had a guy out that you should have had another out at third base, but you went too early. This interesting ball game. What a play. Nice play by Jack Winnie. 
sticks, and they could crawl themselves back into a ball game and very quickly as they scored five in that last inning against a very good pitcher in Josh Hartle. Sebastian Gangora falls behind the leadoff man for Wake Forest. This is Tate Ballestero, the catcher who swings and misses. It's one and one. And this really helps out Gangora also, right? You come the first two innings, you give up five runs. You're thinking this is not going the way that I want to. And your team comes out and has your back. And as a pitcher, and I've seen it in the big leagues, where all of a sudden a pitcher might be getting hit early on, your team comes back, and that just gives you energy. Called strike three. Breaking ball locked up Ballestero, and that's the first out here in the third. Well, Gangora was the Horizon League pitcher of the year a year ago at Wright State. He was an all freshman Horizon League the year before. Did not play at all in 2021. Dayton, Ohio native, was originally going to go to Sinclair Community College. But at the end of 2020, that junior college dropped all of their athletics. And so he was in a position where he had to find a spot to play. And the best option was walking on at Wright State. He's turned it into an exceptional career. With a little bit of hardware and has now moved into the Friday role for Louisville. He faces Austin Hawk. One one inside. It's two and one. See, I don't mind that pitch at all because he's having trouble trying to get guys off the plate, and guys are just kind of creeping in on him and taking away his outside pitch. So he miss. It's two and two. Once you start throwing those fastballs into righties for a lefty, what you're doing is now that hitter is thinking, "Oh boy, I better hurry up and turn and burn on this," and that's when you get your swings and misses away. Runs back to the mound, knocked down by the lefty, stays with it, throws to first in time to get Hawk two outs. All right, let me ask you a question. D just yeah, as, a, as a hitter, does he need to throw that fastball for a strike on the inside part of the plate for you to have to have to respect it, or is it enough to just try and get you to think about it? Yeah, just think about it. That's all you have to do. Just that little thought of you know what he is coming in. He hasn't thrown a first strike. But eventually he will, so I need to be ready for that pitch just in case he throws it. And that little hesitation gets you to swing and miss. Cam Nelson takes a strike, and he can start in center field. Don't let the batting average fool you. Nelson has been on base in half of his plate appearances this season. And down low, it's one of one. It's not often the guy comes into a game with a 174, 513, 217 slash line. <laughs> <laughs> There's a strike. It's a one and two. Nelson, very highly touted recruit from Baltimore. One of two freshmen making the start in the outfield tonight for Wake. The pitch. Sounds like he fouls it off to the left and out of play. That's funny. You look at a batting average of 174, thinking, boy, this guy is not doing anything. And then you look at an on base percentage, you're going, wait a minute. This guy's on base percentage is 513 or whatever it is. It's incredible. That would just low. It's two and two. He has walked 15 times in 40 plate appearances. That's crazy. A 513 on base percentage. He gets jammed on that one, rolls it to first. One, two, three inning for and throw it, especially for your team. It's that confidence boost. First pitch to Eddie King Jr. swung on and missed. It's 0-1. King grounded out his first trip. And he takes down low, 1-1. One, one. one of the things we talked about with Tom Walder uh, about Hartle, in addition to not being able to put guys away, was Chip Smiley and it's 2-1, was that he has been struggling to get his pitches to finish where he wants. One thing he mentioned, Gabby, was that when he was effective a year ago, he had a two-seam fastball and a changeup that would move away from righties. And that one fouled back. And then use his cutter and his slider in either into righties or away from lefties. And it does not seem like he has been able to get those into the right lanes. Again. And, and I'm kind of curious as a hitter when you start to see a guy 
struggling to separate the plate like that. What are you trying to do to get him, to keep him out of his rhythm, to keep him from being effective? So answer the moment is that one ends up in right field, a base hit. King blistering one past Seaver King. Here's the thing, what you're talking about is that tunneling action, right? Where every single lane, every single ball comes off the same tunnel, and then you have the cutter and the slider that's gonna go one way. You have that sinker, the change that's gonna move the other way. So you have two balls that are, or four balls that are going on the same location and then breaking off about halfway before they get to home plate. So as a hitter, when you're seeing that, it's tough because you have four pitches that they could be, and then you have to make your decision very quickly. What's going on right now is that the tunnel is not in the same spot. Pitch up and in to McCoy as he missed his spot badly there. It's 1-0. Oh. So, so as a hitter, I'm going to pick and choose which part of the plate I want to attack. I'm not going to try to attack in for a lefty, so I'm going to just look for something out over the plate away. So from your standpoint, you would be looking for that two-seam fastball or that changer, right? Something Correct. on the outer half. Yeah. And, and giving him the inside part and trying to get him to prove that he can command it in there? Correct. If you start to show me that you're throwing a whole bunch of strikes in there, then that's when all of a sudden I go, okay, I have to change it. But if you're not, I'm going to look out over something where I can get extended. He hits McCoy there, and the first two have reached for Louisville in the fourth. Well, this game has changed very, very quickly. That is the 36th hit by pitch for Louisville. 36th hit by pitch by the Cardinals this year. That's a, that's some big West action. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not afraid to just take it either. They're not moving. I, I played, I moved. I, I don't want to get hit by a baseball. Logan Beard lays down a sacrifice bunt attempt. Hartle looked at third, double clutches to first, but gets the out. The runners move into scoring position with one down here in the Louisville four. Well, Hardle did a good job of getting himself off that mound, and he was going to go try to get to third base. He was trying to get the lead runner. You can see how quick he got out, but there was just nobody there. You got to get yourself to third base. You cannot just leave her. Tell her as soon as that bunt gets hit and you see that Hardle's going to make that play, you got to bust it back because he didn't bust it back. All of a sudden, Hardle has to turn around and just get the out at first. Good stop there by Ballestero. It's 0-1. You know, we've talked a little bit about Wake's defense. Sometimes plays not made, while they don't show up as errors in the box score, have an impact. That one shot to the left side and fair. Pass Delier down the left field line. Two runs are going to come home to score, and Louisville has the lead, 7-5. to five. The number nine hitter, Dylan Hoy, with a chopper down the left field line to give the Cardinals the lead. Well, he got that turf hit, and that's where playing on turf, you can get bit. And this ball chopped straight down, goes right over the head of Tellier. Nothing he can do there because he's playing infield in. You can see how big of a hop that was as it gets by him. Probably going to be a hit anyways because he hit it down that third base line. But a good job by Hoy there getting that base hit, scoring two. And boy, this Louisville team just has continued to swing the bat. Zion Rose has been on base twice tonight, the leadoff man. This was 5 nothing Wake to start the third. And Louisville's answered with seven runs. For the first of the runners back. Here's the thing, Mike. There's a lot of game left to play. And guess what? Wake Forest, they've got some bangers of their own. This score is not going to stay 7-5. to five. This looks like it's going to be one of these high-scoring ball games. So Josh Gunther getting loose to late steal for second to throw by Ballestero in time. And a big second out. Well, we know that Louisville likes to run, and they're going to put pressure on, but this is not the best of jumps. Great throw there by Ballestero to get the out at second. Yeah, McDonald is coming to ask a question here. I mean, it was pretty clear that the throw beat him. The, the only thing that I can think of him asking is if whether or not there was a blockage at second base where you were putting that knee down and didn't let 
the runner slide. And I think they're basically saying that's not the case. He was ahead of second base. He had the tag. Mark, looks like that front foot may be in front of the bag there. I mean, what, what they're saying is basically that throw took him over there when he went to go catch the ball. Mm -hmm. So as a second baseman, I still need to be able to make the play. I can't just kind of stay out and just lean my upper body because that ball is going to get away. So he made the step to catch the ball, then to put down the tag. That's going to be uh, a topic of conversation at In the, the major, major league level this year <laughs> with the rule change there. Outside, it's two and two. Apparently, some people were unhappy with one of those calls today. I believe it was in the Mets spring trading game, but that's been a, a college rule for a long time. On the ground to the left side and through for Zion Rose. He's on base for the third time today. A huge turnaround first. And he'll have to hustle back with a slide. Boy, Rose continues to impress at the top of this little order. He was, I mean, this is a very good pitcher that he's facing today, and he ended up trying a walk after an 0-2 count, then comes up and gets a big base hit, his next A-B, and then another base hit here, and he's a guy that can run to get himself into scoring position. There's JT Benson. Pitch misses low. It's 1-0. 7-5 Louisville in the fourth. You know, they're doing this too, Gabby, without two of their best left-handed bats in the lineup. Dan McDonald sitting Lucas Moore and Isaac Humphrey to get more right-handers in there against Hartle. I mean, that's 11 players deep that you can run this Louisville offense. And it's 11 players when you start to go down those averages in this Louisville team. <laughs> there's a lot of 300s in there. I mean, it, it really is impressive. You're looking at a team that, as a team, is hitting 343. They're having an incredible offensive season. Dan McDonald said, we are very offensive. Pitch, chopped to the left side. Glove there by Tellier. Strong throw across. In time to defensive. And it's going to take long to turn. But boy, 18-0 to start off this season. They are red hot, and this is going to be their biggest test so far this year. Mitchell Salvino leads off for Wake Forest as they trail by a couple runs here in the fourth. Florida State 18 0, their biggest win a midweek game against Florida, who apparently is just going to struggle through midweeks but win the weekends. That's <laughs> right. It's one and two. I, I tell you this, I saw that Florida team when they played against Miami. That's a very good ball club. Up and down, one through nine. They've got a lot of good hitters. Salvino in the air to deep left field over the head of the left fielder Benson. He will take a big turn at first and have to hold on. As the throw comes back behind him, but a leadoff single for Wake here in the fourth. Salvino's first hit of the game. twice in the night. And Mike, this is the problem. We talked about this being a home run park. Well, guess what? You hit a ball hard. The guys are all the way back at the fence. They just turn and fire in. So this should have been a double, but there's nothing you can do as a base runner because it's not it's close. It's coming off that wall. You're getting it in, even though that throw was off. Being down by two, so Salvino with the smarts of, hey, let's not go ahead and push this. Let's just keep that runners going. We'll go ahead. We'll stay at first. You can see he's trying to be aggressive and then says, oh, let me not risk this. We've got the top of the lineup coming up. These are where we, our big boys are hitting. Yeah, it looked like maybe that Tom Walter was asking a little bit of whether or not the, the first baseman, McCoy, impeded the progress of the runner. There was no contact there. Very difficult to call him obstruction without contact. But the first pitch misses outside. It's one and oh. The runner would have to try and go to second in order for obstruction to be called, but there was no signal, it seemed like, from the umpire to make it think that he saw obstruction there as well. I understand where Coach Walter's even, coming from. Right, but you're right. Even if there is an obstruction, you've got to make your way over to second base. It's in the dirt and gets away. And Salvino will be in scoring position anyway. Don't go anywhere. Gangora, who had really settled down in the third, now in trouble again here with Javar Williams. 
The freshman leadoff man who's been on base twice. Gabby's already gone on record saying seven runs will not win this game. So. <laughs> it's just two good hitting teams going out there. And really, when you start to look at it, Gungora and both Hartle having trouble getting guys out. These both teams are just swinging the bat extremely well right now. 2-0 to Williams. Swinging a bouncer to the right side. First baseman McCoy has it. He'll take it himself on the play. So he goes to third. And it's a for it. That's good, just good team baseball hitting by Williams. Understanding the situation of the game. We talked about Tom Walters, and that's what he's teaching. Situational, what are we supposed to be doing? Guy on second with no outs, and you're a lefty up. Pull that ball down into the ground. If you get a hit, that's an extra bonus. If you're out, we at least get a guy into scoring position. See if you can make this a 7-6 ball game. Here's Tellier. In that critical spot, man at third, less than two outs. He swings at the first pitch and misses 0-1. A little over-aggressive. <laughs> We've seen him be over-aggressive today. We saw it in his first A.B. when he was attacking the fastball. Here's a situation where, again, understanding what you need to do as a hitter. There's a called strike on the outside corner, and it's nothing in two. And that's the one that you're looking for. You're looking for that fastball, something out over the plate that you're able to drive to get extension with that bat hit. That pitch, you can pull for a home run, you can hit it out to center, and you can also hit it out to right. So you will have to battle now. He swings it, chops it, will get the run home, and it'll get into center field. A two-strike base hit for Adam Tellier, and Wake trails seven to six. Yeah, make it a 21 on the streak for him to start this season. Been on base every single game. And how about this two-strike approach? Hit it straight down into the ground. Gets that high bounce off the turf. Also gets himself an RBI. But here's the other thing that you look at. Even if you're on dirt and you hit that ball, that's going to get over the pitcher's head. You're still going to probably get the hit, and you're still going to get the RBI. Yeah, I think it was interesting that Louisville played the infield in infield there. Day. Up a pair yeah. of runs. With two strikes, they brought them in. And that probably helped enable that ball getting through. Now, it would have been a very tough play, I think, for Hoy if he'd been back to be able to throw out Tellier, who runs well. But interesting decision there, and that helped it scoot into center field. Well, uh, of Tillier, they're ne they weren't playing anyways pinching him. They were playing mm -hmm. regular depth. So I think that ball, no matter what, is going to be a hit. But you're right. I'm surprised. There it goes. The throw down the second, not in time. Tellier using his wheels to get into scoring position with the tying run. But you will see that a lot with coaches. When you get to two strikes, they're going to go ahead and bring that infield in to see if they can save the run. But that's a beautiful jump. What he did there was, hey, first movement, I'm gone. He's not paying attention to me. As soon as that leg started to, to lift, he was going to second. Pick off throw to second and tell you're back in. Seaver King today has walked and tripled home a pair. Has a chance to tie the game or give Wake the lead. The pitch. Swing and a miss. Boy, that was a good change up there. Long one. Well, that's a very, very good change up. You know that this Wake Forest team is being very aggressive. That is a perfectly executed change up down and away. It looks like a fastball. And all of a sudden that pool that string gets pulled. King on the ground to the left side. Well, first and it's in and out of the glove of McCoy. Tellier will race to third. He's going to be sent home. No throw. Tie game 7-7. Seven, seven. Wow, we've seen some mistakes on both sides and both teams have been making them, especially on that defensive side. And each team is taking advantage of it. This is a routine ground ball. Ball gets thrown, and it just hits off the tip of the glove by McCoy. Gets away with him, but how about the smarts? I tell you there, just taking off, scoring easily from second on that throw. It took so long for the right fielder, King, to get to it that now King is in, Seaver King is in scoring position. And here's Jack Winnay, 7-7, seven, seven, last of the fourth. Second. 
came back standing. They're going to call a block. They're going to call a block. What, do you, what did you see there, Gabby? It, it looked like his step wasn't directly to the base. Uh, yeah, I mean, what it looked like is when he came up, he just kind of nonchalantly came up with the leg and then just couldn't get himself around. And that's where that throw came in, and there was the balk. So he comes up, and it's deception of the runners. You can see it comes up, and then he's not to second. He steps towards first. So he didn't get hit at two with the guy on third. You got to watch out about bearing that slider too much into the dirt and get that ball away from your catcher. Big spot here against the cleanup man, Jack Wene, who swings and skies one to left field. Moving behind it is Benson. He'll make the catch. Tagging and heading home without a throw is Seaver King. And Wake Forest has reclaimed the lead, 8-7. to seven. Rene, just beautiful job there, understanding the situation. I told you that Corbett likes to throw that slider. He has a very good one, but with a man on third, I'm going to look for a heater, and I'm going to look for something that's up in the zone. And if it's a slider, I'm letting it go because I'm hoping that he's going to dirt it. Does a good job of staying on that fastball and just get, getting the job done. And that's something that we've seen from both sides of these hitters. On the pitching side, they've been having trouble. On the hitting side, whenever there's a situation, they have gotten the job done. One of the liners. That one lined into right center field. It's a base hit. So the inning continues for Wake with two outs. And here comes Tate Ballestero. Switch hitter will bat left-handed this time. But you're not kidding, though, Gabby. I mean, let's give the hitters some credit here for both of these teams. In this inning alone, Wake has executed on two man at third, one out situations. It's just, and here's the thing, they put themselves in that situation too, because remember, there was that balk move, that balk that got mm -hmm. him to third base, where if you don't balk, that's just a fly out to left field, no harm, no foul. First pitch to Valcero fouled away. It's 0 and 1. Stero executing with a man at third and less than two outs in the first, delivering a sacrifice fly. Here's the 0-1. Low on the count, 1 and 1. Corbett having a little trouble with his lid tonight. <laughs> uh, you know what I've noticed, too, and I see it even with young kids playing, you know, rec baseball. Everybody's wearing a hat that's about two sizes too big. There's a strike. Corbett's hat goes down again. <laughs> and it's a one and two. Apparently, Corbett's nickname is the Mad Hatter. <laughs> and the hat falls off on every pitch. Here's the one two instead of throwing a first. Now, it stayed on on the throw over. I agree, though. Like, you go to amateur showcases and guys are losing their hats all the time. I think it's because they're trying to to size it over the lettuce. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. I got no lettuce anymore. <laughs> In the dirt. And now caught up between first and second is Reinish. He'll run to second. And he is tagged out there. And the inning is over. Reinish. So that's you know, I think Josh is throwing better than his line for sure. You know, defense hurt him. You know, a couple walks there in that in that five run inning. There were a couple walks, and you know, we were out of position on a ground ball that got through. And then the, you know, the bobble in left field really hurt us too. And then you know, obviously made the one bad pitch, and and Napleton didn't miss it. But uh, I think he's throwing better than his line score. Uh, Coach, one thing that you have to be happy about is the way that your hitters have been able to just come out and stay poised and continue to score runs. Yeah, we're grinding at bats and, and we're running the bases really well. So, you know, even there with Jake Reinish, I mean, I think that's the right read there with two outs. So really pleased with our at bats and the way we're in the way we're running the bases for sure. Coach, we appreciate the time. Best of luck the rest of the night. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, Tom Walter, the head coach at Wake Forest. The number 16, Demon Deacons, with an 8-7 lead as Josh Hartle goes back to work. This start isn't all that dissimilar from the last one for Hartle, who gave up a big inning against Virginia. And now the, the difference here is that Napleton hit a grand slam. He didn't give up the big ball in that outing, but before that home run, there wasn't a ton of hard contact against him. First pitch. No, there was not. Strike 0-1. 
when you look at the way that that inning transpired, he did give up a couple of walks, but you look at it, you know, you had that one play at third base when they got, uh, who wasn't in a rundown, it was, uh, I believe it was either Rose or Hoy in that rundown. That really hurt him because you kind of get yourself back into a relaxed mode, and now all of a sudden it's bases loaded with the big hitter up. Luke Napleton who delivered that grand slam in the third leads off the fifth with an opposite field single. I'm going to start getting in the bullpen here for Wake Forest and that's been an issue for them. They're a little less experienced than a season ago. Their closer Cole Rowland still out with an injury. He has not pitched yet this year. They are hoping to have him back within the next couple of weeks hopefully for the Virginia Tech series. Starting to get healthier after this week is Wake. First pitch bunted foul by Keelan. It's 0 and 1. Eight seven Wake Forest leads in the fifth. Yep. Yeah, Michael Massey is there has been their Sunday starter. Swing and miss. It's nothing in two, and he's been dealing with a hamstring issue as well. And Massey was one of the best relievers in the country a year ago they had moved him to the rotation it sounds like he could be available this weekend the question is will it be out of the bullpen or as a starter swing and miss that's the first down Hartle is second strikeout boy that's vintage Hartle right there like that's the thing with Hartle that all of a sudden you get those glimpses of whoa there it is it's just being inconsistent right now it's, it's better to have that inconsistency earlier on in the season and then all of a sudden when you get to playoff time to be right on, but it's one of those things where when he is on, he is tough to hit. Despite all those struggles, he has a chance to give him at least five innings tonight. And that's certainly better than what he's given in the first two starts in conference play. So we get a job of a foul. It's one one. Well, here's the thing. We, we, we just finished talking with Tom Walter, and he said he is pitching better than his line, right? So as a manager, when that's what you believe, you're going to let your guy throw because you know what? We've made mistakes. It's not his fault of what was going on and what transpired. We should have been out of the inning or out of the game. That's a tough play for Ballestero. He does not throw to first, an infield single. And two aboard with one out here for Louisville in the fifth. So that's one there. Field base hit for Lippy. That's one there. If you're Ballastero, you let it go. You know you're not going to be able to make any play there. That ball is hit. He's going, you're going to be running down that first baseline. You're not going to be able to get anyone out there. You're hoping that because that ball was hit towards the end of the bat, that there's a lot of rotation and spin on that baseball to let it go foul. Eddie King Jr. hits and takes the ball low. It's 1 0. King singled and scored in the two run fourth. That gave Louisville the lead. We had a chance to get even or take the lead back here in the fifth. Swinging a chopper to the left side. And Tellier will let it go foul. 1 of 1. Get a look at what Hartle has done tonight. He's thrown four to third innings in his first two starts in the ACC combined. Five and a third innings, 12 earned runs, and the five strikeouts of three walks. That's maybe the most stunning for a guy who's one of the top strikeout pitchers in the nation a year ago. Well, you look at the non conference compared to conference. Remember, these guys, a lot of them, when you're playing conference, they saw you all of last year. They kind of know what you are doing, they have the tape. The whole entire discussion when you're having your, your hitters meeting is, hey, this is what we need to do to be able to be successful. So it becomes a little bit harder. For Hardowitz, what adjustments do I have to make? Because guess what? The hitters have made adjustments on me. Here's the 2 one. So you foul out of play. It's 2-2. Two, two. Never mind, Hartle had a really rough freshman season at Wake Forest and then spent the entire summer revamping his delivery and pitch mix last year. Wake Forest famous for their pitching lab. He worked with Corey Muscara, their pitching coach, and former lab coordinator Mike McFerrin, who's now with the Oakland Athletics. And then he gets a big strikeout here of Eddie King, two outs. This is a guy who 
grew up in the shadow of Winston-Salem, just about 20 minutes away, was a really well-regarded recruit, and now had put together an incredible year a season ago. Yeah, just a beautiful cutter there down in the zone. You can see the action. It's 89 miles an hour. It's moving from left to right into a lefty and then down on a, below the plate. It, just a beautiful pitch. When he's throwing that pitch, that's when he's been successful today. It's that elevated ball just not getting it down in the zone. And, and we talked about it. Ballestero, what is he good at? Getting that low pitch and making it look like a strike. But you got to be able to get down there and be a pitch that he's able to work with to make it look like a strike. Oh, one's fouled away. It's nothing but two. Now, despite the traffic, Hartle one pitch away from getting out of this inning and keeping it an 8 7 lead for Wake. Pitch. Swing and a foul at the plate. Foul ball at the plate. Just did get a piece of it, did McCoy. And he stays alive. He's been on base twice. Walked and hit by a pitch. Big spot here for Hartle. Big spot here for Louisville's offense. The pitch. Swing and a grounder to the right side. Gloved by Winnet. He'll take it to the bag himself. He's really, really happy with the way the offense has performed so far tonight. Yeah, I mean, this is not going to be uh, an instructional game, uh, instructional video, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm just happy. It's a, it's a one-run game, right? So it's uh, two really good pitchers on the mound that maybe weren't their best. The defense didn't play great, but I'm just I'm glad we're in a one-run game right here. Uh, Coach, going back to Gongora, what did you see out of him today that you haven't been seeing throughout the whole entire season? I mean, there's... You know, there's a couple walks in that one inning. There's the HBP. Uh, that was the epitome of we just gave a lot of free bases. If, if you think about it, I mean, I, a ball didn't leave the yard. Their one ball was off the scoreboard. It wasn't a bunch of extra base hits. It's kind of hard to fathom. We gave up seven runs on, you know, a couple base hits. and But just all the free bases, the pass ball, the balk, the error. I mean, it's just frustrating uh, to give up. I guess eight runs uh, in that. So I really didn't think he pitched that bad. Hey, what's the struggle with getting a hat that fits for Corbin? Yeah, I don't know. It's a little bit of the uh, the violent head jerk. But hey, I remember Max Scherzer in high school, and I won't say what the pitching coach was, but sitting behind home plate watching him pitch, somebody was trying to say he's got too violent a head jerk, and maybe that school didn't recruit him. I'm sure they're regretting. <laughs> You know, Max Scherzer's violent head jerk back, back in high school. So that's Corbett's thing. That's awesome. Coach, we appreciate the time. Best of luck tonight. All right. Thanks, guys. Dan McDonald, the head coach at Louisville, is Caleb Corbett and his hat retake the mound here, trying to keep this a one run deficit. And the first pitch is a breaking ball strike to Tate Ballestero, the catcher. And it'll be Ballestero, Austin Hawk, Cam Nelson, the scheduled hitters for Wake Forest. A strike, nothing and two. Well, you can see right now with Ballastero up where they're playing, the whole entire shift. You're not able to do that in the big leagues, but you're still able to do it in college. So they're definitely saying, hey, he hits it onto the ground, it's going to be to this right side, and they're leaving everything on that left side open. That's the third baseman in the league, Beard, that's playing in shallow right. Called strike three. Well located. Fastball at 95. One out. Well, what a pitch. 95 miles an hour. Right on the bottom part of the zone. Freezing Ballestero. So Logan Beard getting his steps in. Heading back to third base. Here's Austin Hawk. He's 0 for 2. Hawk was a high school teammate of tonight's starter for Wake, Josh Hartle. Reagan High School. The UNC transfer waits. Swings and misses. Nothing in two. One thing that we know is that Hawk is, his offensive numbers have not been there yet, but there is 
certainly more coming from him offensively. In the dirt, it's one and two. He is a muscular kid, too. I mean, look, he is, I mean, he is that kind of modern second baseman. He's got the, the uh, Marcus Giles starter kit. <laughs> One, two. Outside, it's two and two. And one of the things that I've noticed, too, with this Wake offense, every single guy gets up there with two strikes, and they're choking up. I and mean, it's not just a little choke up either. I mean, it's about an inch. They're making that bat smaller, and it's just, hey, we're trying to punch this ball and get a base hit, not trying to do anything else. Swing and a miss. High fastball blown by him in back-to-back -back strikeouts. And we're going to start the inning. That'll bring up Cam oh, Nelson, who's over two. Boy, what a pitch there. Fastball elevated 95 miles an hour. Even when you're choking up, it's a hard pitch to get. Just because he has good RPM, that revolution per minute on that fastball, it's going to stay on plane throughout the whole entire wave zone. It's not going to be dropping at all. Wake with a one-run lead as they hit in the fifth. Swing and a miss. Nothing in one. Anything above the belt right now seems like it is a challenge for opposing, opposing hitters. One and one. And the first time that Corbett has lost his hat in this inning. <laughs> Swing and a miss. One and two. And again, right, elevated fastball. The guys are just swinging underneath it. Usually, you know, when guys have good revolution on that fastball, it's going to stay on. But most of the time, that ball will fall and guys' bat path gets to it. Tap foul. But when that fastball stays on plane, especially up in the zone, it is tough for a hitter to be able to try to just get on top of that baseball and drive it. Usually, you're going to see a lot of swings and miss right underneath it. One, two, and I'm low on the count, two and two. Now, I hear hitters talk more about those fastball properties, right, and where you have to start your swing on those pitches. I have to think that it's a little bit easier if you have seen a pitcher a couple of times, right, than just yeah. talking about it theoretically. Well, you know, it's funny. When I was playing, spin rate really wasn't a thing. They didn't right. talk about spin rate. You would come back and be like, man, I thought I was all over that pitch. I don't know how I, I swung and missed. And two foul back by Nelson. But now, all of a sudden, they have so much analytics and so much numbers that you know, oh, this guy has a high spin rate. What am I going to do as a hitter? Well, at this point, when you're facing a guy with good spin rate, especially up in the zone, it's almost like you've got to feel like you're chopping down. And then you're going to be on play with that fastball. Called strike three at the knees. Nelson, nine and one, due for Louisville. The first pitch to Logan Beard is down low, one and oh. Gabby Sanchez, Mike Farron with you. Be with you on a lot of Thursday nights this season across the ACC. Chopper foul. It's one and one. What's your take on the conference and where it sits right now? I'm kind of curious because you, you've been locked in a little bit here. And it's it's an interesting group. It, it is an interesting group. There's a lot of good teams in this ACC, and you can see it throughout the rankings. A lot of teams that are ranked. And here's the thing. You go back to, let's say, that UNC versus Miami. Miami not being ranked, but they were able to take two out of three against UNC, and UNC has been beating everybody. You go to Duke. Duke's got power on the mound. They've got power in the bullpen. They've got guys who can hit the baseball all over the place. Clemson, you know, number four in the country. So going, you know, that's what, seven teams in the top 25 for the ACC. And those teams are going to be beaten up on each other. It's a fun conference to watch. And the third, tell you, throw off the leadoff. Man, starting the sixth. It's, it's interesting because, to me, I don't think we have a lot of answers on these teams yet, right? Wake's pitching has not been maybe what we expected. Although, you know, if they can hang on tonight, they do have Chase Burns going tomorrow, and Burns has been 
arguably the best pitcher in the country, maybe with the exception of Hagen Smith at Arkansas. And that's a maybe. So a strike. But Wake feels like a team that is going to get better as the year goes on. Duke got off to a great start. You mentioned Clemson. The team that I'm really interested in, there are two of them. One is your Miami Hurricanes, who just seem to have an awful lot of fight in them. I mean, they are winning some really difficult games at this point. And the other one is Virginia Tech. Pitch in the dirt. It's one and two. I heard some comments this winter from John Sheff, the head coach at Tech, saying that this club reminded him of the 2022 team, which went to a Super Regional, hosted a Super Regional. And I'm really intrigued by Tech right now. And that's the thing. It's that every single team that you're looking at in the ACC is going to be able to compete with everybody because there it's it's a very very deep league. And I know that everybody always talks about the SEC and how deep they are, but guess what? ACC is just as deep with just as good as players, and you can see it because time and time out, even this game, Louisville versus Wake Forest, you can see Louisville the way that they're swinging the bat. They're not ranked, but they're a team that can go out there and they can stay with anybody because of the hits and because of the bats and because of what they can do on the offensive side of the game. I think it's a great point, and I think that there is less disparity between the SEC and the ACC this year than maybe in, in some previous seasons. I mean, it really is a very, very deep league. And, you know, listen, like we, Virginia's ranked. Like, Virginia's got a lot of questions on the mound, but there's a ton of talent on that Cavalier squad, right? I mean, it's top to bottom, the league is as strong as it's been. And there are a lot of regional hopefuls in this group. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if you ended up with, what, nine or maybe even, I realize it's a big number, but maybe even ten teams in the ACC, especially when you factor in the struggles in the Big 12 and the Pac-12. Swing and miss. Cardinals fourth strikeout, third in the last two innings, two outs. I, I just love that Tom Walters is, is like, hey, you're our guy, and I'm going to let you go out there and throw it because I feel like you've been throwing really well. And in that pitch, that's the one that he was having trouble with today. It's that breaking ball and making it look like a strike and then ending off as a ball. That ball has been up in the zone or real out of the zone. Zion Rose lines one to second. Austin Hawk is right there at 13th in the country. It is a very good year for the Carolinas in baseball. Wake has an 8-7 lead here in the bottom of the sixth. I'll tell you this, Mike. Whoever made that graphic deserves a raise. That was very cool. <laughs> Little pop-up pennants. Another good two. I mean, both states, North and South Carolina, with some outstanding teams. So they miss. That's four straight strikeouts. And the young man going here for Wake as Salvino retired for the first time tonight. And here's Javar Williams, the leadoff man. Mike, Corbett's making this look too easy. Holy moly, he is some kind of nasty. Got a fastball that rides up in the zone at 95 miles an hour. Then you have a slider that's just what we call wipeout slider. And as a hitter, I'm going up there going, well, I have to pick and choose one of those pitches because I ain't going to be able to hit them both. First pitch of Javar Williams. There's that breaking ball strike. It's 0-1. Seven for seven on first pitch strikes. Incredible. No one. Swing and a miss. Nothing in two. Mike, it seems to me, too, every single count is basically 0-2. He is just going after every single one of these big forest hitters. The 0-2, swing and a miss. Five straight strikeouts. Well, he is really giving Louisville a chance. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. And the fastball works, and then he comes up with this pitch, the slider down in the zone. I mean, it is in really impressive what we're seeing on the mound with Corbin. Sebastian Gongora went just three and a third, his shortest outing of the year, but Corbett's keeping his team in the game. And he got Tellier to pop it up on the infield. And it's a one, two, three inning bat misser, but he has struggled with his control to this point. Nine walks in 11 innings. 
Takes over in the seventh here. It'll go through the heart of the Louisville order. Breaking ball inside, 1-0 to JT Benson. Benson, Napleton, and Keelan to hit here for Louisville. Josh Gunther getting the heart of the order, the freshman right-hander. There is a little less experience in the Wake Forest bullpen than there was a year ago. That's a strike. So we talked a little bit to Tom Walter about that earlier this week. We mentioned earlier today Cole Rowland is out. Michael Massey could be available out of the pen. Might start on Sunday. He's been dealing with a hamstring issue. Those are two key guys a year ago. Swing and miss. It's one and two. But there were so many pitchers that were keys to that game, not the, to that team last year, not the least of which is Camden Massey at the end of games. The Wake has a lot of sophomores that didn't really pitch in high leverage spots last year and a number of freshmen with good arms. Gunther's one of them. His fastball gets in his kitchen. It's one and two. Yeah, for Gunther, it's a really good fastball. Again, we talk about spin rate. Got very good spin rate on that fastball, which is why he's able to elevate it. But he also has a very good changeup. Guys are only hitting 143 off his fastball, hitting 222 off the changeup. So he has those two good pitches, and if he's able to utilize that changeup now, probably will get a swing and a miss. It's a breaking ball that's popped up, foul territory. Alistair hustling over, but it's well out of play. He does have a slider and a curveball, uses the slider more than he uses the curveball. Only 5'11. He's another one of those that's one of the trends here with relievers that are under six feet tall, but they have that lower arm slot and the high carry fastball. And you can see the way the fastball jumps on hitters. Pitch. Breaking ball fouled away. Back to back breaking balls. There's no way he's throwing the third in a row, right? This is going to be the Ched. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I would think maybe that elevated fastball, which is I'm surprised that they didn't go back to it just because it's a very good swing and miss pitch. Looks like he's going to try and go up. Fastball fouled away. And, and that's fine. Do it again. Just get it a little bit higher. It's called climbing the ladder. Right, you start off in the high part of the zone and then you keep climbing that ladder to see when a hitter is going to finally not swing at it, but you're setting up your next pitches. One, two. Swing at a chopper foul. A good at bat from Benson here. The leadoff man for Louisville down a run in the seventh. This will be the ninth pitch of the at bat for the right handed hitter. Dan McDonald told us this week. Our offense goes as JT Benson goes. He's had a quiet night at the plate so far, 0 for 3. Swing and a miss. One out. Luke Napleton bats, and he has the big blow in this game for Louisville. They were down 5 0 to start the third, and then Napleton delivered. 5 1 ball game, base is loaded against Hartle. Gets a slider over the heart of the plate, and boy, he just showed how strong he is hitting that ball out to center field. Swing and a miss. It's 0 and 1. Napleton was the Great Lakes Valley Conference Player of the Year a year ago at Quincy College in Illinois. One. He swings and pops it up. Foul territory. And get out of play. It's 0 and 2. Louisville has made most of their strides taking players out of the upper Midwest. And, and not that Illinois is really the upper Midwest, but Illinois, Wisconsin, even Michigan and Ohio. Players who think that Louisville is south <laughs> and can appreciate the winner. As somebody who grew up in the Midwest, I can appreciate a Louisville winner compared to Chicago. Swing and a miss. That's a nasty breaking ball to us. Boy, that is a nasty, nasty breaking ball. And here's the thing, too. We showed the first two pitches. It was a fastball up, fastball up. Then all of a sudden, here you go, a slider down and away. Just a tough pitch to lay off of your hitter. It doesn't matter if you lay it off of it, because that was going to be strike three. It was a perfectly placed ball by the freshman Gunther. Two outs, uh, Keelan. Wisconsin native takes high, 1-0. 
Keelan 0 for 3. Wake's pitching has done a pretty good job against the heart of this Louisville order. Got a one run lead. Swing and miss. I mean, you can see why Josh Gunther is pitching at high leverage spots, can't you? This is pretty incredible. <laughs> it's just both of these guys, Corbett and Gunther, coming in and pipping just nasty. Pitch down low. It's two and one. It didn't miss by much. <laughs> hey, that's the one with you, a hitter, Mike, and you kind of take your step back and you take a deep breath because you're like, Ooh, that was close. <laughs> <laughs> In there, done that one. Ooh. Two one outside, and it's three and one. Is, is that the confident take? You want it to look confident to the pitcher, so you think you make him think about it. And you're just I going. Mean, you try to make it look confident, but body language says, Ooh, no, that wasn't confident at all. But that was a nasty change that he just threw right there too. A lot of action to it. Three one fouled away, and the count's full. Two outs, nobody on top of the seventh. Louisville batting down a run. Keelan with five homers this year has the power to get this game tied if he gets something to handle. A pitch. Swinging a fly ball. Left field. In the alley, it's Williams. He'll make the catch. And a one, two, three. Here's my fastball up in the zone. Here's my slider down and away. First pitch to Seaver King is a strike. Corbett, no walks, five strikeouts, six times he's lost his hat tonight. I'm not sure that that's accurate. That's just, I should be keeping track. Here's the 0-1. So we get a tap and foul. It's 0-2. So he lost it again. Somewhere a Louisville fan is listening to us, Gabby, going, we get it. His hat's falling off. <laughs> Reminds me of like a Kyle Peel. Remember when he was hitting, his helmet would fall oh, off every yeah. single swing. <laughs> you got to love it, though. Hey. It's working, and you keep doing it if you're a pitcher. He has been dynamite tonight and kept Louisville in this game. Swing and a chopper foul. I mean, this game was what? 7 7 in the fourth inning, right? And Hartle settled down. And Corbett has really done. Look at that. 10 first pitch strikes to every hitter he's faced, he's been ahead in the count. Here's the 0 2 to King. Oh, just missed. One and two. And, and that's the thing. Even the misses make you think as a hitter. It's not like, oh, that's definitely a ball out of hand. It's like, oh, boy, that's close. He's just going with the pass, but he can go with that slider here down and away. That one just missed, too. It's two and two. In his last eight innings of work, Caleb Corbett has given up three hits. Based on the way he's pitched tonight, that tracks. Yeah. Two, two, follow away again. Oh, and King really frustrated with himself. He had a pitch he wanted. All these guys have gotten pitches that they can handle, right? And that's what frustrates you as a hitter. Because you're like, I'm on it. I feel like I'm on it. I see it out of the hands. It's a straight fastball, and I'm getting there. But it's just, I'm swinging underneath it. Swing and a miss, and that one gets to the screen. King is going to reach on the wild pitch. Sixth strikeout for Corbett, but Wake with a base runner, upper run here, and here's Jack Winnay. He's been on base twice. Moving into the cleanup spot tonight. And Wake without two of their key members of the lineup. Preseason All-American Nick Kurtz. And shortstop Merrick Houston. So they playing first and hitting in the middle of the order. Throw it to first and King dives back. Well, Tom Walter, he can rest easy today because he was very nervous about moving when they up he wanted to kind of keep him comfortable in that six spot but he had to move him up because of the injuries because you need a, a good hitter in that four hole and guess what it's worked out great for him today 
because when is one for one with an RBI had that sack fly and also walked. And the throw over the first and King is back. Seaver King five of six in stolen base attempts this year. This would seem to be a spot. I guess generally the middle of the order up you don't necessarily want to run but it feels like one more run could be a big deal here for Wake the way this game is turned. Pitch in the dirt it's 1-0. Oh. Well, the, the thing is though that Corbett's pretty quick to home. He's about a 1-2-1-3 one, one, to home and in this type of situation where he throws a lot of swings and miss pitches I don't know if you want to go ahead and try to extend and, and expand and try to get yourself the second more hoping maybe that he throws one of those sliders in the dirt and it's a dirt ball and that way you're able to get to second so from your standpoint as the base runner would you let's say you have the green light you see your king are you thinking great secondary lead and take off as soon as it hits the turf yes the dirt. that that's exactly the the mindset it's going to be tough you know to just steal because he's so quick and he has a lot of swings and misses, especially with a 95 mile an hour fastball. And I don't want to just get thrown out at second. So I'm going to take a bigger second there lead. So if I see that ball down, I see the angle down, I'm going to go ahead and take off. But he also has quick move over to first base. So you can't really get a big lead to expand it. You got to stay a little bit closer to first, but then you really have to work on that secondary and gain ground. And he's ahead in the count. Pitch. Swing and a miss. Tied him up with that fastball. It's two and two. I was wondering too about, you know, obviously he's very concerned about King as Corbett. If you get in his head enough, if it impacts pitch execution, I'm always fascinated by that with base runners and pitchers. And that was a, a closer play at first that time, but what is that, five times he's thrown over in this plate appearance? Yeah, uh, what, what the thought process is, is, hey, you know, you want to expand, maybe have a one-way lead where you're just going back to, to first, and maybe with that thought process is he'll leave something over the heart of the plate for the hitter to be able to crush. And to the left side and through, it's a base hit. King will stop at second, and wait, threatening first and second. Nobody out. And here comes Jake Reinish. He leads eight to seven. That's going to be interesting, too, with Coach McDonald and McDonald. You know, you have a guy on the mound who has 41 pitches right now, even though he's been lights out and he's been throwing the ball extremely well. How much room do you give him? Or do you have to say, hey, we have to go get him because he's starting to be in that no man's land of pitches where he hasn't been before. And you can look at, you know, velocity being one of those things where is he tired enough? Where is that fastball velocity? Is it still 94, 95? Or now has that dropped down to 90, 91? And that will impact your decision on, hey, we got to go get him because we need to try to keep this game where it's at. Ryan is singled against him. His first play pass, and he bunted that one out in front of the plate. His only play will be to first, just in time to get Reinish. It's a sacrifice. And now runners at second and third with one out. And here's Tate Ballesteros. Three times we've seen Wake Forest today have a man at third and less than two out situation have been able to execute. And Reinish setting Ballestero up here for that. Yeah, right. It's just a beautiful job of moving up, making sure that he's using the big part of the field and just getting that ball down. That's all you have to do as a bunter. You want to get on top of that baseball and make sure that the trajectory, as soon as it leaves your bat, goes straight down into the ground. That gives your base runner an easier lane to be able to just take off as soon as that ball hits. Change up misses low to Ballestero, 1-0. Ballestero was one of those wake hitters that cashed in on a man at third, less than two out opportunity. That sacrifice fly, capping a three run first. He's also struck out looking twice. His second plate appearance left handed. Swings and misses. Good change up again. It's one of one. And here's the thing for Corbett you got a base open, right? Righty lefty matchup. You don't have to just go out there and try to strike him out. You can throw your nasty pitches and if he swings and misses and you get your strikeout, great. But you have a righty on deck right now in in Hawk where you can have that double play in order to be able to get out of the inning. So at this point with a one two count you could just keep throwing that slider down and see if you can get another swing and miss. 
three infielders into the right and now time is called and Wake will use one of their three offensive timeouts. Talking to Reinish here one and two the count. He's seen a couple of change ups and a really good breaking ball. I know you want to hunt the fastball. Gabby, is it you hunt the fastball and you let it get deep on you, especially right now with shortstop being completely open. That's going to help you stay on that slider, and you're still going to be able to react to that fastball. So you let that ball travel just a little bit more. I actually will say, just like he did, I was going to say, back yourself off the plate just a little bit so that your hands work. Pitch in the dirt and a really good stop that time. By Luke Napleton on the count two and two. Wake Forest eight, Louisville seven. Wake with the chance to take control of this game again. 2-2. Two -two. Swing and a miss. Strikeout number seven for Corbin. Two outs. This second base was number nine. Seven. That ties a career high in strikeouts. And Austin Hawk takes a breaking ball low. One and oh. Louisville was going to ride the hot hand out of the pen. Boy, if they can ride Caleb Corbett this season, he is going to help them win a lot of games. Called strike on the outside corner. It's one and one. Still pumping 95 as he gets 50 pitches deep into this outing. Mike, it's like we've called games before because that's where I was just going to go. When you're cold, oh, you're looking at that going, hey, he is still throwing 95. Leave him out there. Mitch. Ball misses. It's two and one. Hawk being very disciplined here. He struck out against Corbett back in the fifth. Second and third, two outs. Wake up a run. And now time is called. Hamilton wanted to run through the signs again as he called for time. Two balls and a strike to the right-handed hitting Hawk. The pitch. Down low, it's three and one. Freshman Cam Nelson is on deck. This started with a strikeout wild pitch and then a single, a sacrifice bunt, a strikeout. Two outs and two in scoring position, a 3-1 count for Hawk. Big pitch here. Call a strike. Oh, a 3-1 slider, and the count's full. That's just not fair. I know that you have first base <laughs> open, but it's still righty, righty. You've been getting a lot of swings and misses on that fastball, and you just went 3-1 and said, here's a slider for you. 8-7 wakes the payoff. Upstairs, ball four, the first walk issued tonight by Corbin. And it loads the bases, and here comes the freshman, Cam Nelson. Nelson tonight tried to butt his way on in the second and was retired. He's grounded to first and struck out looking. This is a big spot for the freshman center fielder. Highly regarded recruit out of Baltimore. Left-handed hitter choking up. First pitch. Swing and a miss. High cheese. It's 0-1. And that's what you don't want to do. If you're Nelson, not overswing, especially with a guy that has a good spin rate on that fastball. You try to overswing, you're definitely going to be underneath it. The 0 1, swinging a foul out of play off to the left. And now Corbin, one pitch away from getting out of this. It feels like momentum is hanging in the balance a bit. Game that was a barn burner early has slowed down. Wake clinging to a one run lead. Looking to tack on. Corbett set. The 0 2 in the dirt. Good take that time from Nelson, 1 and 2. Very good take on that slider. Again, you have to look him up in the zone, but that's the problem too when you're looking him up in the zone. That fastball is tough to hit. To stay on top of which is why you want to kind of choke up just like you're seeing and just try to put it in play 
One, two, chop towards the middle of the field, and it'll be gloved by the shortstop Hoy, and everybody's safe. An infield RBI single for Cam Nelson, and Wake leads nine to seven. Just great two out here. Not trying to do too much. Choke up, just put the ball in play. Good things will happen. And for Cam Nelson, it's exactly what he did. Gets a, a slider just right on top of it, hits it straight down into the ground. Of course, gets that turf off to go up into the air and gets himself an infield hit. Mitchell Salvino takes a breaking ball strike on one. And Mike, how about this? The run that scored, Cedar King, he got on base on a strikeout pass ball or wild pitch. The 0-1. Upstairs, it's one on one. These little things in today's game have mattered a lot. Little misplays, throwing to the wrong base, a misplay on a rundown. Right now, Wake has the advantage, nine to seven. Swing a liner in the left field. It's a base hit. One run is home. Everybody else moves up 90 feet. A big night of the plate for Mitchell Salvino. His second hit on base three times. And it's now 10-7, Wake Forest. Huge hit in the bottom of the lineup, coming up big. Salvino, again, it's that slider, but this time it's a hanger. Stays up in the zone, doesn't have as much break as his earlier one, and he's able to stay through it, drive it to the left side of the field slider. The freshman, Javar Williams, will hit. He's been on base twice, one for three with a walk. Both times he reached base was against the lefty, Gangora. Left on left matchup with the leadoff man. First pitch. Put away 1 0. One of the things that really impresses this Wake Forest staff about Williams is he is not a guy that goes outside the strike zone very often. Here's the set. The 1 0. Outside, it's 2 0. As a hitter, I know you want to be aggressive. It's 2-0. You're like, oh, now you can go up there and you can keyhole. Hey, if he throws it in this one uh, spot, I'm going to go ahead and be aggressive on it. For me, I'm going to go ahead and take. I'm going to put the pressure on the pitcher. 2-0, there's a strike. And just what you said. Maybe a little two-seam fastball on the inside part of the plate. It's 2-1. If he can extend the inning, the powerful Adam Tellier is on deck. 2-1. Way outside, it's 3-1. 3-1, I'm looking for a heater right down Broadway. If he doesn't give it to me, fine. 3-2, <laughs> runners are going to be moving. A lot of pressure for the pitcher to throw a strike here. 10-7, Wake Forest, the pitch. Ball four. It's a bases loaded walk. And it's now 11 to 7 Wake Forest. Third time Williams has been on base. And now here's Adam Tellier with a chance to bust things wide open. The ninth man to bat in the inning. Tellier, an RBI base hit back in the fourth. He is one for four. He's been the best player for Wake Forest to this point this season. The grad transfer from Ball State. The Michigan native waits. The first pitch in the dirt. Knocked down by Napleton, 1-0. First pitch off speed to tell you, that's some respect. Yeah, that tells you a lot. Say, hey, I can't just go up there and just think I'm going to throw you a fastball because we've seen Tellier today be very aggressive, especially on those first pitches. The 1-0. Outside corner, a strike. It's 1-1. Wake Forest with three runs home in the inning. Campbell trying to keep this close. Let Louisville's offense go back to work against a Wake bullpen that struggled with its control. The pitch inside. It's 2-1. Tell your weights. 
The 2-1 down low, three balls and one strike. Seaver King lurks in the on-deck circle for Wake Forest. I'm telling you, again, it's a keyhole. Right down the middle, fastball, that's what I'm looking for. That's the pitch that I want to attack, and that's the only pitch that I'm going to attack. 3-1. Inside, ball four. Back-to-back -back walks. Another run comes home. It's 12-7, Wake Forest. And we talked about tough situation coming into a ball game where you cannot make any mistakes at all. You have bases loaded against Wake Forest. You got the top of the lineup who can all swing the bat and you try to be perfect. And I get it, I understand it. It's not easy to be up there understanding the game of baseball where, hey, I, if I'm not perfect, this ball can go a long way. First pitch is a strike to Seaver King. Some grooving with the music as he came to the plate. King struck out to start the inning but reached on a wild pitch. And that's helped lead to a four run inning for Wake Forest so far. Campbell a deep breath the 0 1 swing and a miss pulled off that heater it's nothing in two. A little too much turn to his burn. <laughs> hey, 94 all of a sudden uh, Campbell's out there throwing 94 95 miles an hour. The 0 2 swinging a high chopper over the mound and be a tough one. It's an easy hit. Infield single RBI for Seaver King. It's now 12-7. And King, I mean, that is what Wake Forest has done today. It seems like just putting balls in play. Good things are going to happen. Another high chopper takes a big bounce off of that turf. Goes too much into the air. And for Seaver King, just too fast. You're not going to be able to get him at first. Smart play there by Hoy to see if he's able to catch a base runner kind of napping out there running third. When A takes a breaking ball strike, it said it was 12 7, it's 13 7, which matters here because Jack Wene, if he hits a grand slam here, would end this game. Owen won the count to Wene, the first baseman, a pair of hits and a walk. He's also flying the left, the pitch. Swing and a drive down the right field line, slicing and going foul. <laughs> that looked Beyond like it had enough, moment. too. Mm -hmm. It is very tight down the lines here. There's a lot of foul territory, but it is easy to reach the other way for a right handed hitter. 0 oh 2 the count to an A. Wake by six. The pitch. Swing and a miss. Campbell blows him away with a fastball. And the inning is over. Wake sends 11 to the plate. 10 for the whole, I mean, it's just been unbelievable. What a game. Matt Klein is going to pinch hit to lead off the eighth. Josh Gunther back to work for Wake Forest. I know things are disappointing right now for Louisville fans as things have gotten a little bit away from them in this game. But Kentucky was just upset by Oakland University in the NCAA basketball tournament. Well, not that my bracket. Root for the demise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not rooting for the demise of the Wildcats. I want to make that clear in case there are any SEC fans in this league. But I do know Louisville fans were undoubtedly hanging on the outcome there. The 0 2. Up and away. Check swing. No swing. 1 and 2. So your bracket's already busted? See you later. Is this <laughs> is this later in the game than you normally get before having it fall apart? <laughs> yes. Our ACC baseball games of the week. Next weekend feature the here on ACC Network. The ESPN app. We can be back. Here is Isaac Humphrey, who's riding an eight-game hitting streak pinch hits, the senior. Wait, leading Louisville 13-7. We'll be 
on that game for North Carolina and Wake Forest next weekend. We also have Miami and Clemson next week, I believe, on Thursday night, right? Which is going to be a fun mm -hmm. one. Really excited to talk to J.D. Arpiaga. Swing and miss. That's the best, right? I wanted to. There's the set. Way high to the screen, just a bit outside. Two and two. So did your bracket live longer than it normally does, or is this a common? No, account? this was, yeah, this or was, I, I have two. One was a family one where I was just like, oh, you know what, let me kind of put different teams out there. Don't do that. That doesn't work. <laughs> two, two. Swing and a miss. Back to back strikeouts for Guthrie. He's got four. He'll sit down all five of these uh, we, we, talked to, boy, we talked about Corbett. My goodness, Gunther has just come in and completely shut down a really good look for offense. And he has been doing it, utilizing his pick, all of his pitches, having that good fastball velocity up in the zone, breaking balls down. He has looked phenomenal today. First pitch is a strike. Ryan McCoy. First baseman, a, a key defensive miscue in this game for him, dropping a thrown ball that led to a run. Swing and a miss, it's over two. Boy, has been such a valuable veteran hitter in this Louisville lineup. He's going to have to battle back behind 0 and 2. Gunther set. Cold strike three. Pulling Camden Manassi and Bennett Lee, two guys he grew up with, after hitting the walk-off home run to send LSU to the finals. First pitch to Jake Reinish is a strike, 0-1. Wake leads here 13-7. I was doing that game on radio, Gabby, and that is one of the, I mean, like, it was almost, like, got a little dusty in the booth because that is one of the greatest pieces of sportsmanship I think I've ever seen at any level, and especially when you consider the magnitude of the game, his first thought after winning it was going to console his friends. That was incredible. Yeah, and just a cool moment there. And what an eight in that bat by Tommy White. It was a lot of sliders, a lot of sliders, choking up, and just looked like he was just trying to make contact with so much power, and it was able to leave the yard. But I remember I was glued to that set watching that game because for me, it was almost like a championship game in that game right there. Like, it was unbelievable. Louder versus Skeens. Both were dynamite. Two of the top seven picks in the draft last year is Reinish with a base hit. Lead off single. Jake Reinish here in the eighth. Defensive changes. Corbin Dickerson takes over in center field. Isaac Humphrey stays in the game in right for Louisville. Couple of changes there. You can see Humphrey. Wake Forest up by a half a dozen here. As we're going to get a pinch runner at first for Reinish. A lot of changes here. Antonio Morales is going to run. Oh, and we're going to have a pinch. And we're going to have Tate Ballestero, Ballestero Baz, switch hitter batting right-handed here. He's had two plate appearances from each side of the plate. 0 for 3 with a sacrifice fly. First pitch. Oops. Oh, called strike at the top of the zone. It's only one. It's hard to believe we are just about three months away from the Men's College World Series Finals this year in Omaha. Who will make the trip? There's a strike. Nothing in two. How many ACC clubs will be in Omaha this year? We've got some pretty good contenders in the conference. Wake is one of them. Upstairs, one and two. 
Louisville strikes me as the kind of team, Gabby, because they have, you know, this was a more veteran lineup tonight, right? But they have a number of freshmen and sophomores. I would not be surprised if the second half of the season no one wants to play Louisville. Outside. Uh, I, it's here's, I don't think anybody wants to play against Louisville now. Fair. You look at yeah. what they can do top to bottom in that lineup. They can put a bunch of runs on the board. And they're never going to be really out of any ball game just because they can put up a whole bunch of runs and quickly too. We saw it today where they were able to score five in one inning. And how quick was it? I mean, it just it, it seemed like it was just oh here's the score. It's you know five to nothing, and then it was five to one, five five. Like in a second, they were able to score five runs. You, this is going to be an offense for Louisville this year that if you give them extra outs, your life is going to be miserable. Like it, it's yeah. You, they're just going to, they run the bases so well, right? Like they have young players that are exceptional base runners. They have a lot of speed. There is power there too. It's not like this is a one dimensional offense. It's not like it's, it's singles and stolen bases. They can hit the ball out of the ballpark. Foul away. And Gangora just did not have a good night. As good as he was Friday against Virginia Tech, he just struggled to land pitches when he needed to tonight. And he was, I mean, he battled. And that's one thing that you can give him. He was out there and he was battling for his team. But you can tell it, like, there was just some pit. He just was not completely sharp with his pitches today. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen in baseball where you, you're a pitcher, you go out there, and there's just something, whether it's the mound that you don't like, whether there's different possibilities that are out there. And you just, hey, I didn't have it today. And then you go back to the drawing board. And you go, okay, where, what did I do? Okay, let's get back on track. In the air to center, Dickerson moving into left center to make the catch one out. I think the other thing that Dan McDonald's players get better, right? Like it's, it's one of my favorite lines. Butch Thompson, the head coach at Auburn, has used it often. Players are allowed to get better, right? And it's something I think as analysts, talk show hosts, play-by-play -play announcers, we don't keep enough in the front of our mind. Players are allowed to get better. And the thing about Louisville is that it is such a good player development culture and a strong track record of it. Oh, what a play by Campbell as he will throw to first for out number two. That was an excellent play. Not an easy one at all. No, that's, that ball was coming right back at him, face high. And he was able to get the glove up and hit the deck. And here it is, a good pitch, gets up there. And the reflexes come out. I mean, that's right at his face. I mean, you look at the tumble, you're glad he's all right because that uh, foot there could have easily twisted the ankle, gets up, fires over to first. You know, we'll say McCoy had a good job of picking that ball too. That's not an easy yeah. one. That went off the glove of Napleton, but not far enough for Morales to advance. But just to finish the thought on Louisville, it's a really good, strong player development culture. It's what Dan McDonald and his staff preaches. These players are going to get better. These young players are going to get better. And by the end of this season, it's, you know, they're going to get figured out on the mound, too. I, I'm really impressed by the talent they have. Outside, it's 2-0. and And here's the thing. With their pitchers in the bullpen, they're going to get more comfortable. And then you're going to be able to really piece where your your guys who all of a sudden are starting to excel and you're being, being able to put them in the right position to be able to succeed. I mean, we saw it today. Corbett, I mean, he was unbelievable coming out there just firing. He's a guy that they're going to probably lean on. But he's also going to build that relationship with the other guys where they start to learn from him. Outside, it's 3-0. And, oh. and listen, it was a close game when Corbett came in. You're trying to keep it down a run. He did a great job of that until things kind of, you know, listen, this is the longest outing of the year. Things got away from him a little bit in the seventh. The wild pitch on a strikeout didn't help. That you know, There were some opportunities that Wake Forest cashed in on. That's a four-pitch walk to Nelson. These are, and they're going to be getting better. And I think, you know, for, for Dan McDonald, he's, hey, I need to see what's out there, and I need to make my team better. Carabas' first appearance in an ACC play. First pitch is popped up foul, first base side, and out of play. It's nothing in one. 
Kirk Kowal, but it's a four pitch mix, a fastball, a changeup, a slot, and a curveball. Likes to throw that changeup a whole bunch. That fastball is going to be running in the upper 80s. You might see touching in that low 90s. It just saw Vino two for three tonight with a hit by pitch. Nice job in the nine hole, and he hits one high in the air to deep left field. Back to the fence, and it is out of here. Mitchell Salvino, three run home run, and Wake has busted it open. It's 16 to 7. Salvino making his first start of the year. Three hits and on base four times. Well, it looked to be a changeup that just got hung up, and boy, it got lost into the night. A three run homer, his first of the season for Salvino. What a game he has had today. That's four RBIs for him, three for four on the night. Big production out of the number nine spot. Here's Javar Williams, who's been on base three times at the top of the order. Foul away. It's number two. We talked about Louisville earlier and how they're going to improve as this season goes on. For Wake, this is a much needed potential Friday win if they can get the last three outs. Williams takes low, one or two, or if Williams homers here and ends the game, but. Either way, they have struggled on Fridays and Sundays to this point with Chase Burns lurking. Their first ACC series win is a distinct possibility tomorrow. Inside, it's 2-2. Two -two. Mike, the thing I want to touch on, 13 two-out runs. That's something that you do not see in baseball. You don't see that many runs coming when there's two outs. Here's the 2 2. Down low, Williams, another good at bat here as he's run the count four. If two out hits get you to heaven, what do two out runs get you? Oh, boy. Contract extensions? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of money, big league, that's for sure. 3 2. Down low, Williams walks again. Third time he's walked tonight. It means the winning run is aboard, and here's Adam Tellier. Two singles for the third baseman. That's the eighth walk from Louisville pitching tonight. Now, well, Mike, you're not going to be stealing right now, so you're going to have to hit him in, that's for sure. But, boy, for, for Williams, that's what you want from your leadoff hitter. Just getting on base consistently. A hit and three walks. Been on base all but one time. Down he swings through the first pitch fastball on one. You, know, you look at this, the box scores on Javar Williams and what he's done, and it's impressive. And then you get a chance to watch him play. There's some work that needs to be done defensively, but it's a really good approach for a freshman. Tell you're in the air to right. Humphrey is there. He's got it. Inning over. He'll utilize in that fastball change of slider. Fastball anywhere between the low 90s, 91, 93. But you just want him to go out there and just kind of work the zone. Hey, it's a nine run ball game. Just go after these guys. Falco, a grad transfer from the University of Maryland. That's a strike, it's another one, too. Everybody, clap your hands. Tomorrow's game, game two of this series between Louisville and Wake Forest has been moved up because of potential weather. Called strike three. It bounces away from Ballestero, but he'll toss the first. One out. The game is going to be played at noon Eastern time now because of pending weather. And Saturday's game, the series finale, is scheduled for 1 o'clock in Winston-Salem. So if you were at home tonight, and watching this game, but we're planning on getting to the ballpark tomorrow. Just know you're going to have to call in <laughs> to work. And, and we encourage that. Just start doing, that we Mike, just start doing the cough right now. 
have the baseball flu. Lucas Moore hits. <laughs> One of those three dynamic freshmen that Louisville has been playing this season. You see the numbers going to go to 400. Takes a strike. And this is been much better work out of Wake Forest bullpen tonight. They have set down all seven that they faced. Walks have been a big issue. So this, it's never been two. Cup has got good movement with that fastball too. It's got some line arm side. So it'll go into a, a righty, goes away from a lefty. Last year at Maryland, a 388 ERA. Pitch clock violation and Moore is down on strikes. I don't think he was in the box with eight seconds to go. And that's going to lead Gregory Street to come over and talk to Dan McDonald about what caused it. Remember that rule has been added this year in college baseball. It's identical to what they have in Major League Baseball. The batters has to be in the box and dressing the pitcher with eight seconds to go on the clock. And that's yeah, what and that's the big one, right? It's being engaged, meaning I have to have my hands up ready to hit at that eight second mark. It's not just being in the box, still moving the bat around. I've got to be engaged. And McDonald. Mouth agape, <laughs> explanation there. He does not seem to like it. <laughs> no, he's not happy at all with that rule, but it is the rule. And we saw it last year, I saw it a whole bunch last year in the big leagues where guys would do the same thing. They're like, what, I am in the box. And they're like, no, you've got to be ready to hit. You can't just be in here still waving around the bat. Patrick Forbes, the Sunday starter for Louisville, will get a pinch hit appearance here. He checks the swing and fouls it back. He hit his hand. Are they going to say no swing? Well, that's the last thing you wanted if you're Dan McDonald as to whether or not you get your Sunday starter in there. And takes one off the left hand, so two out hit by pitch. That's the first base runner allowed by Wake Forest since there was one out in the fifth inning. Oof. Yeah, I think you got lucky on that one because it definitely looked like that bat came straight around as that ball was diving in. I told you it's good run on that fastball. So to the right, it's going to go up and in. So it looks like a strike when he's releasing and then that ball just starts working its way in towards those hands. Alex Alisea is going to hit here. The freshman takes a strike. Switch hitter from Milwaukee, St. Thomas Moore High School. He also has had a very good start to his collegiate career. Away, it's nothing in two, and Wake Forest one strike away from winning the opener of this series. Falco set the 0-2. Swing and a miss, so the ball game is over. Wake Forest had a 5-0 lead.